that has occurred in America. Many people have rejected the gospel because they don't believe that Christ is able to unify his church. That's just what it is. They don't believe that we can be in the portal for them. We say stuff like, well, why do we have a black church? Why do we have a white church? And I would argue it's because we are not biblically exercising Christianity, but rather we elevate our culture oftentimes more than we ultimately, ultimately, uh, we ultimately portray Christ. And live by us. So, so, so this is specifically seen, well, I'll start with, with my African American context. Oftentimes, in our African American context, we mix culture with Christianity. Uh, in this, and I'll give you an example. So, so, so you think about rappers, for example, like Lil Wayne, a plethora of others, I think some of the newer dudes, Playboy Cardi, Lil Uzi Vert, some of the dudes. So they'll get up there when many of them accept awards. I don't know, not specifically those ones, but many of them will get up there and accept awards after they had this vitriol language and then say stuff like, well, I just want to give honor and praise to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> but those two things are incongruent. That's because we mix this unbiblical notion of Christianity with our culture, right? So it's a distortion that occurs there. So that's, that is truly, truly problematic. We don't ignore that that is something that occurs. I, I live in Camden, New Jersey. I have met many people. Everybody I've met has told me that they're Christian. And I'm like, how do you are a Christian? And you smoking weed. You're in front of me, long weed. I'm like, you smoking my face. Well, God don't judge. God don't like others. Where in the world did that come from? So, 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 so it, it's, it's blatant. So it's that, it's that unbiblical, cultural Christianity, nominal Christianity mixed with culture. That's on one side. But on the other side, we have conservative evangelicals that, that mix uh, Christianity so much with the American flag. So they, so they sort of mesh that together. And they sort of see the church, they sort of see uh, the founding fathers almost to the, to the level of apostolic fathers. So, so that's problematic because you create this sort of civic religion because our founding fathers should be judged on the basis that though they declared freedom for all, they denied it to some. It was just simply denied to some. That's not something that we, so, so when we get up there and we're political pundits, and we say vote for this person or vote for that person, we're actually losing our prophetic prowess because we're not emphasizing kingdom values. We're emphasizing a political structure. And I'm not saying that's anything wrong with, with having political enemies. We see among, we see among Jesus' disciples. He called Herodians and he called tax collectors. We, we see that that goes on before, that there were some arguments in that. But all I'm simply saying is, is when you mix unbiblical cultural Christianity on one end, and then you mix Christianity with this civic religion on one end, you have a budding of hands. We need to call out sin as sin. George Washington was a sinner that needed Jesus. Amen. On Mount Vernon, he owned slaves. He beat the slaves. He mistreated them. Thomas Jefferson and Monticello, he raped sound news. We've got to be able to call a state a state and be honest about that and not mix our love for our country so much with Christianity. We have to not see them necessarily as binary. You should love your country, but all I'm arguing is that when you politicize so much, and we that is a big impediment to a lot of people coming to know Jesus. That's all that's all I'm arguing. So we can argue about well, I'm not for abortion. Uh, well, you know, just because you're not for abortion doesn't mean that you're really pro-life. Because once that baby is born, a lot of my brothers and sisters aren't running to the hood to sort of take care of that mother and all that type of stuff. So we have to, I'm saying I'm arguing, I'm not beating anybody up. I'm just arguing that we have to be honest that we are so in, we are so so very influenced by our culture that it becomes warped in our own mind. What's the distinction between cultural Christianity and biblical Christianity? Mm -hmm. All right. I didn't think I was going to get on that. I would expect to leave. <laughs> so let me ask you. So so the the question is is why has Whitewash Christianity become an urban apologetic issue. Like, how, what is the historical genesis of this thing occurring? 
Well, I've got a timeline and I've got a theory that I that I think really works well. Uh, Christianity Today affirmed it, Sue Chan Ra, Dave Mosberg from the Great. So let me let me just run it through for you. Albert Roberto, who's a scholar at Princeton, uh, he in his book Canaan Land, the African American Religious History, said this. He said that 80 90 percent of the African Americans lived in the Jim Crow South in 1890. So they lived in the Jim Crow South. That's where they had industry and a number of things. But around 1910, there became available some industrial jobs in urban areas. So specifically, New York, Newark, St. Louis, Chicago, Oakland, uh, LA. So what began happening is something called the Great Migration. So why were these African Americans moving to the, the northern states and specifically moving over to urban hubs. Well, because in 1914 through 1916, there was what we call a boa legal infestation. I'm sure some of y'all know about that. That's when this little beetle ate them all the price. So there was no real industry during the South at this time. And during that time, that's when the movie Birth of a Nation came out that really uh, was a movie that really celebrated this new wave of the KKK uh, movement starting again. So what these African migrants were trying to do was they were they were trying to flee the domestic terrorism that was occurring in the southern states. So they began to move to the northern states. Now these southern the southern church the southern migrants was largely intuitive. In other words, they didn't have a lot of access to formal education. And they began to move, I'll use the Northeast for example, they started to move to the Northeast, to the Northeast. And they noticed that the cultural landscape in the North was much different than it was in the South. We noticed additionally that uh, many of the churches that were addressing the need, specifically the Black Baptist churches, that were the Black churches that were addressing the need of, after these new uh, migrating African Americans, they were at capacity. We see an Abyssinia uh, church in Brooklyn, that in, in Harlem, specifically, they were struggling, they, had, they were at capacity. At the same time, when they were moving up to the northern states, there was something that occurred in evangelicalism, you can look it up in uh, The Prophetic Lament by Su Chan Ra and Dave Mosberg, the Great Reversal, that there was something going on between 1910 and 1930 called the Great Reversal. That's when evangelicals became less concerned with social issues and more concerned with individualism. So as these migrants began to move to the southern states, it didn't exemplify the city on a hill that they thought it once did. So then what they what many conservative white evangelicals did is they fled to the suburbs, leaving the city, leaving these leaving the ethnic minorities in the city. And you know, during that time, there was something called racial steering. There was racial covenants. Uh, there were a number of things where African Americans couldn't even look for. Yeah, right, right around 1930, 1932. There was a lot, there was, was African Americans did not have access to buy even in those areas. So, so when they were being exposed to all of these religious preferences, at the same time, whites were fleeing the city. Rather than provide, that's when they became acquainted with black Jews, black charismatics, black spiritualists, black Catholics, and a host of other things. The churches were struggling to supply the needs. So what happened is when we could have depended on conservative evangelicals to help in this time, they moved to the suburbs, became very focused and concerned with liberalism, and then we didn't have a lot of contextualized resources that the churches could have worked on together. So now you have this, this, this boom of urban, religious syncretism, urban mismatch theology, and sort of urban uh, black spiritualism that doesn't match Christianity at all. I know that was a lot. But what I'm saying is, the urban catastrophe, the, the urban context that we have now, with a whole bunch of these different urban folk religions that have developed, falls on the shoulder as of us as the American church. Because rather than dealing with these issues as a church and sharing our research resources, we became separated because of race, 
class, ethnicity, and comfort within our own culture. That's what happened. That's just the God's most truth. There was a time in which we could address these difficult racial issues in our nation, especially the church being on the forefront of it. It did not happen. Now, I'm not suggesting here that African Americans, well, many of the African Americans that made their way should have chosen these other things. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we didn't work together to put together, to put together contextualized resources that address this ugliness that we have in our inner city. So now we have to have conferences like the One Tree Conference and a myriad of others to address these issues because even though it could have been dealt with earlier in the 20th century. So, so that's, that's what I'm arguing. So the great reversal is occurring. There's a fleeing to the suburbs. There's less concern with social issues. And during that time, that's when the African-American migrants moved up to the northern and the different states. So you have a layering that's going on. And rather than us taking advantage of this head on, we decided that we were somewhat decided to move to the suburbs, not to be concerned about the issues of ethnic minorities specifically in the inner city. So this is what we look at. So this is what I would call, there was an urban catastrophe that was going on, and it falls in our lap. We sinned, we erred, we should have addressed that, we did not. We, did, we just did not. So, so that's the historical backdrop. But somebody said, well, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable with those terms. Um, I think we should, you go to the next time. I don't feel comfortable with those terms. Can you give me uh, an example? Well, let me, let me give you an example. There is a conservative privilege that occurs in, there's a conservative privilege that occurred in white evangelicals, right? I want to explain. Conservative evangelicals tend to be more informed about the contributions of Europeans to Christianity and less familiar with that of ethnic minorities. That's a sense of privilege. Now, privilege doesn't necessarily mean that you may in the life that you have because of your skin color, but there's some unmerited favor that's given to you based upon skin color. So one of the examples is that we are largely, as a church, one of the this is a apologetic issue, we are largely unaware of any involvement in history of the church outside of what happened in Europe. And as one commentator notes, when we look at college books, theological resources from what ethnic group. Some say like this. So when we look at resources, books from one specific ethnic group, what we do is begin to form cultural blind spots. That's not a white or black thing, that's something that really happens. When you only listen to voices that mirror the color of your skin, you develop blind spots and begin to believe. And, and it can lead you to believe that your history is the only one to grapple with. When in fact we should grapple with a multiplicity of histories if we truly want to see a multi-ethnic church and if we want to address racial issues in the church. So sometimes, so in many ways, we become conservative evangelicals, sometimes we become we become socialized into this sort of passive racism that appear, that believe that that their that that theology and history is those are the only things that Europeans have contributed to and not African-American or African people, all right? So you move that. So let me just give you a little bit of a survey to just let you know that we need to grapple with multiple histories. We need to grapple with a ton of them, and it's dependent upon us to do so. So by the end of the second century, North Africa, North Africa was thoroughly Christianized. So according to scholars, it spread more quickly in that part of the world than any other. Right? So, so through African, through African Christianity, it found one of its one of its best, most surest homes in Northern Africa. But because of the intellectual needs of Alexandria, the intellectual needs to interpret the text, what was started was a school in Alexandria. There were others in Carthage, there were in the city of all a ton of them. So, so Egyptian scholars were translated the New Testament into the local Coptic language, at least from the early third century. Here's a little map. I don't know if you can see everything on there. Uh, at the bottom, that's Alexandria, which was started by John Mark. We have Carthage, which we have number, a number of them. Antioch, Caesarea, which we consider the Canaanite, Palestine, and all that type of stuff. Uh, you can go to the next one. 
So, so let's just talk about let's let's just talk about the history that occurred in North Africa, specifically in Alexandria. So, so some some credit Mark who became a missionary to India, but it was more likely that Pantheus uh, was the one that founded this, this school. And after him, there was a gentleman named Clement of Alexandria. He had the distinction of being the church's first. Wait, not that. He had, he had the distinction of, of really making Christianity intellectually and philosophical, so philosophically respectable around the world. And then after him, he wrote the Didiche. And after him, there was a man who was born in Carthage, right in Tunisia, right in that area. His name was Origen. These are all African church fathers. Origen followed him and was easily the most influent, one of the most influential theologians of his time. It was said that he studied theology for hours a day and that he was skilled in Platonic theory. He goes to the next one. Origen was born in Alexandria, and what he did was he contributed over 2,000 treatises to Christian learning. And most of went, and he did most of that through his homilies, his sermons, and he did a, a number of that through commentaries. And he paved the way in the Alexandria school for uh, the allegorical interpretation. That was at odds with the Antioch school, with Eusebius, with Ignatius, and people like that. And then followed after him was another African father named Didymus the Blind. As his name indicates, he was blind since his birth. But he wrote several commentaries uh, and built up the library in Alexandria, so much so that the person that helped translate the Latin Vulgate. Uh, Tyrannus and Phoenix, the famous Jerome translator, sat at his feet and learned from him. Right? That's, that's important. I go to this. Here, here's, here's, why, here's why I mentioned Origen specifically. There were other great theologians and church fathers called the Turkish, called the, the, the church fathers named Basil, Gregory of Nazantius, and Gregory of Nyssa. These guys were respected theologians that bought theology to what we know now to be Asia and Europe, right? So that, that's a big thing. Uh, and we'll, I'm gonna explain that. So, so, so furthermore, many of the Greek and Latin Bibles were both products of Africa and Rome. And nearly all the Christian exegetes from origin borrow large portions from him. So in other words, many of these exegetes, Basil of Basil the Great, Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, Drew University did a study, compiled all of these records of all of their writings, and they were surprised to find out that many of them took their theology from origin. They were greatly influenced by he, and they were greatly influenced by Didymus the Blind. So that's important because that means that there's an intellectual transfer from Africa to Europe. That's why it's important to grapple with and study other histories because you will see that both of them are important. Both of them have contributed in significant ways. I mean, we think about Athanasius, that Council of Nicaea, called the Bishop of the Canon, fought for the, the Trinitarian doctrine, argued it down to the T, was willing to get excommunicated by Constantine. All of this, all of this happened by African theologians that have pivotally, pivotally influenced the church even until today. That's, a, that's so greatly important. Go to that. So we think about that. So we think about it. So not only is much of Didymus the Blind and, uh, and Origins exegesis borrowed, which would presuppose that Christian exegesis thoroughly matured in Africa before it made its way into Europe. I want to tell you why that's important. It's important because how come that's not the core, how come that is not within the core curriculum of many of our church history books? How come that's not interwoven into many of the books that we read? How is Athanasius, who was a black man called the Black Dwarf, often depicted as a white guy? It seems to presuppose, it's a, it's a certain type of privilege that it's not even interwoven into many of the stuff, many of the books of history that we say we love. So all I'm, all I'm arguing, guys, and I'm, listen, I know, you know, sometimes we gotta have tough conversations. 
I know some of y'all are not going to be happy about this, but I go, I go back to New Jersey before you start throwing tomatoes, so don't be too, too mad with me. But, but all, I'm asking, all, I'm, all I'm just simply saying is this is important. And it's important because many African Americans don't see this and are rejecting the gospel of Jesus. That's a church-wide problem. That's all of our problems. That's, right. That's not like a white thing or a black thing. That's we don't have a correct understanding of history all the time. It is against the contributions of ethnic minorities, and that leaves many people that are ethnic descent to walk away from Jesus. That's a church wide That's right. So, so, so here we go. So, so, the school at Alexandria, the library specifically, it was unrivaled, right? It was a model for universities all over. The fact there was a vast community of philosophers, scientists, writers and artists in Alexandria. Alexandria, remember how I told you earlier, which was beautiful about having a non-river there, is there was some there was sustainability that, that happened because they weren't always, it, it really bought out their creativity. So they can think, they can write, they can see through theology. So what happened is Alexandria provided the archetype of, univer of, of universities all throughout medieval Europe. So the first university in Italy, in Paris, uh, Oxford, in England, they borrowed the tests and examination, the circular patterns, the philosophical approaches. These, these methods were, were refined in Africa from people like Clement and Pentheus. So the whole notion of this four-year degree in medieval Europe with universities was borrowed in Africa first. This is, this is critical. Can you imagine if you have this in your arsenal when you're sharing the gospel to people, when they say it's a white man's religion and we don't have anything to do with it, we don't want anything to do with it, and we lay down our, our ethnic idolatry and say simply, well, look, here are the facts. Origin, many people borrow this stuff. Alexander, there was a great transfer of intellectual girth, of grit from Africa to Europe. That's powerful. That's powerful. So it was only there to so it was only so the advances that were occurring in Alexandria were only rivaled by the theologians in Carthage and what we know as the Tunisian. It was founded by Tertullian, who shaped the Christian mind probably more than any other thing. He's the one that coined Trinitat that we put into our Christian vocabulary. You know, he was the one that coined holy living and spiritual formation. Now, eventually, he would affect the monetists who rejected this Trinitarian formula, but it didn't appear as though it affected any of his doctrine. So, so he was the one that really infused, and after him, was the one that really infused a lot of the words that we use into our Christian vocabulary. You go to the next one. Then we had Cyprian, who was great, who was eventually ascended to the Bishop of Harvard. Uh, this was when uh, persecution was going on. Uh, and many succumbed to the pressure. He simply said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to bring these backsliders that have been experienced the pressure. We're going to bring them back to restoration. Powerful. And then finally, one of the greatest thinkers of our time was that African man. And his name was Augustine. His name was Augustine. He was probably the preeminent theologian in all our country. Right? And he, 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 you read the Confessions, and it's powerful. He was a philosopher. He was a theologian. He was an excess addict, if you didn't know that about his story. He had a lot going on. But he wrote on where you go to the next slide. He wrote on Christian doctrine. He wrote on the Trinity. And he wrote the City of God. And this really formulated the Western political philosophy. Now, listen, it didn't continue. Christianity, it was, like I said earlier, there were a lot of schisms in North Africa. Uh, there was the, uh, there was like the majority of Christianity, the majority of religion until around the 10th century. But after Rome, European barbarians before the civilization, and then once Muhammad began his conquest of the two across the nation, not all of, not everybody that came to, I guess you would say, play in Islam did so because they would be had to convert the sword. Some did so willingly. Uh, but nevertheless, the church was weakened during that time. So, so this is what we're saying. Look, man. Frankly, a lot of the theologians and a lot of of what we see even in the Reformation, with all of these great theologians, <laughs> they can think Africa 
for hammering out a lot of the jargon and theology and building upon that. Right? So, so Christology and the Trinity were profoundly shaped by African theologians and people like Gregory the Great, that Leo the Great, Mediterranean Shores, these people benefited <laughs> from such. And I'm not saying that to beat you up, I'm simply arguing with you that this is something we should put in our apologetic pockets and we should be aware of. And I know some of you, I, I know uh, some of us don't know this, but the question is, is why don't we know this? Why isn't this information readily available? Why don't you know that origin, many, many stuff, but many of uh, the doctrines of origin were borrowed, even by people that rejected worship. And you think about monasticism, they found a shoreline in Egypt. Those are all important points. So you go there. So in any case, there was a significant transfer of intellectual strength, of creativity from Africa to Europe and academia. We saw that in universities, in exegesis, because they were borrowed from or they were borrowed from origin. We see that in dogmatics, in the myth, you can miss the e-community system, y'all come in that going to monasticism, philosophy, and other dialects. This is uber, uber important, and it's not a apologetic issue. Let's go to the next one. Now, now here, here's the point. This is what makes me sad. It's, it's still occurring in our schools. It's still occurring in many of our Bible colleges and our seminaries. Even some of us have fallen into this sort of passive bias, right? So we so you think about it like this, many ethnic minorities, many uh, many uh, conservative evangelical whites, they know about the apostolic fathers, they know about the Antonesian writers, they know about the medieval church, practicism, reformation, but they have no working knowledge of the history of Christianity in Africa, in Nubia, in Abyssinia, in Africa. They don't know anything about the contribution of the African American church. They don't know about the role that the African American church plays in reconstruction, in great migration, in the civil rights movement, uh, or how Christians have sought to argue with black nationalists. They don't really know any of this. Or have read any books by any contemporary, specifically African American authors, outside of Tony Carter and the Dean. <laughs> <laughs> That's very <laughs> That's just the truth. Now, matter of fact, I don't make it black man, but listen. What's even more learning is this many people in reform circles who will not listen to sermons by black pastors unless they receive a stamp of approval by conservative evangelicals. Mm -hmm. Unless they brought up the TTC. Unless they've spoken that together for the gospel. And Lincoln Duncan in the front. Or D.A. Carson, or uh, Piper, any of those. They won't listen to them. I think about somebody that's been preaching the gospel for years and years, like an H.B. Charles. He's been preaching the gospel since he was 19 in L.A. And now, because he's friends with John MacArthur, now he's catapulted into conservative evangelicalism like he's a new phenomenon. He's not. He's been preaching the Bible. You think about Charlie Davis. Who have been preaching the Bible since he was at Salem and before that. And we ain't that for and we only know about him because he preached that song <laughs> and invited to the cutting street These people have been preaching Jesus for quite some time. And what's sad is we will not even engage off the time unless they got a stamp of approval by some white man. That's that's just sad. That's sad. You think about church plans. Church planning, when an ethnic minority wants to plant in the inner city, take any inner city, we have to go raise money at predominantly white organizations. So that means that my livelihood is based upon how well I have learned Eurocentric history. Have I read specifically dominated by white intellectuals? Have I read theology by all of these whites? But yet, on the other hand, Whites have the privilege of not engaging with my history at all. Don't know about any of my theologians. And then on top of that, we'll throw grenades into the inner city and say that they don't preach the gospel, but won't plant no churches there. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality of what's going on. So I'm saying, guys, I'm saying, in contrast, your livelihood is not even going to the your my livelihood is dependent upon if I'm going to reach ethnic minorities and impoverished 
Jewish areas like Kenya, which is one of the most poor areas in the world, I have to know everything about how white theologians have influenced Christianity, but yet the people that are getting money from don't know anything about my history. That's just the truth. That's just the truth. There's a lot of us having an influence of black leaders because it's not interwoven into the, to the majority. It's not interwoven into history, into regular history. It's always in them. You say, well, we have black history. Never read no intellectual fault. Or even if we find out that many of these, these guys are African, we sort of put them up as white guys on purpose. No black art, music, black history, no theology written by blacks. That, that, that's what I'm saying. That is an issue that we have to come to grips with. <clears throat> but I tell you this in Christ, this can be rectified. Amen. In Christ, this can be rectified. We can have conversations about race, and we don't need to have a police shooting to do it. Amen. 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 That's good. We can talk about race without Donald Trump in office. And we should yeah. do this. And we should <coughs> grapple with others. I don't mind reading John Piper. Let the nation be glad, baby. Well, I don't have any reason why Jesus had died. Amen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'll just rename it and use it as another subject. But I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying. Can we read some other voices? Can we read a multiplicity of voices? Can we read a Sue Chan Brown? Can we read a Doug Logan? An Eric Mason who wrote biblical books? We gotta read back and we read a Christian works. That's why that's all I'm arguing here. Go to the next slide. You know why I don't have something to do? Because black faith and black tradition are rarely looked at as worthy sources for learning about how to practice spiritual disciplines and by daily discipleship and share the Christian community. We ask questions like, well, why do we have a black church? What's the point of a black church? Why, why don't we just, we don't need a black church, we don't need a white church? Well, when there's been disenfranchisement historically, when African Americans have not had they are not obeying a firm and haven't had access to certain things that our white counterparts have had. The black church is necessary because it has helped deal with untold multi generational uh, psychological and emotional trauma. Right. Right. That's what it's done. Good one. Yeah. So, though racial tension in this country has reached a fever strip, a fever distress, even now, it would be even worse without the historic black church. Did you know that historic black churches have been planted churches since their inception? Did you know that? They've been bestowing some worth and dignity on African Americans when it's been long denied in many contexts. She's helped brothers and sisters deal with psychological liberation and the negative and destructive social habits. She's assisted in social and economic, uh, she's assisted in overcoming social and economic oppression. She's provided leadership development opportunities when they were largely missing in majority context culture. She's provided a family structure. She's provided opportunities for social networking and businesses within, within the community. Furthermore, the black church has built retirement homes, banks, adopted schools, mentorship programs, provided job development skills, offered millions of dollars in scholarships, built recreation centers, Provided prison after care programs, drug permission programs, and provided housing to the poor. That's important. So when you ask, why is this the, 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 the African American church has been the primary agent of socioeconomic and religious empowerment since the post slavery era? It has trained, nurtured, launched virtually all the credible leaders for quite some time in a range of disciplines, including religion, business, politics, and music. If you take all the urban religions and you combine their impact, they're nowhere close to the black church. And I wish we didn't have to have a black church. But in light of the brokenness of sin and racism still being a reality, we have to address the issues. Started institutions like the black church, found an educational opportunity like Morehouse, Spelman Seminary, which is now known as Spelman College. Jenny Union, Bishop College, and a plethora of others. And you know what's really powerful? 
there was a lot of racial propaganda that the African American church protected ethnic minorities from because they established publishing houses that enabled African writers to print material about their history and place their faith in Christ in a large historical context. So we see that racial oppression is why black people work, because we see that racial oppression is a modern historical development. And because of these publishing houses that were developed, it helped us to, they helped us to be protected from caricature, caricature developments. Black Samuel, Angelina, Uncle Ben, all these genial characters, and women of color being lazy and irresponsible, and black men being uh, menacing. Black church has done that in America. So listen, I'm just simply saying that we need to grapple with this stuff. We need to think about it. We have to think about whether my Christianity is so influenced by my culture that I don't see this as developing an issue in urban politics. We really want the truth. There is a way, instead of whitewashing, let's give credence to ethnic minorities and their contributions to Christianity and Western civilization as a whole. And if we're going to live out Galatians 3.28, we have to have meaning with Paul and Paul's great call for racial, social, gender, and cultural equality. Thank you. Hebrew and Greek scholars to say that it was 
over time historically. But I don't want to hurt my, my brother on that. <laughs> since, he, since he's a scholar in that area specifically, I'm sure he'll be able to give a, a really robust answer on biblical translations. Um, another question is, is there info slash resources of good theology from Native American and Asian scholars? Uh, that's, a good question. that's a good question. I'm still working in that area. Uh, I'm sure some other brothers have read some stuff in that, but I, but I really need to grapple with that specifically. Uh, I have really been reading a lot of Suchet Robinson. Uh, he has pivoted, he has changed my paradigm on how I understand race and justice, uh, specifics of great, greater evangelicalism, uh, lament, prophetic lament, which is a commentary on lamentation, which is very, very helpful. Uh, and I'm willing to explore. I need to find some resources on some stuff, but I think uh, we should be diversity, we should be broad. So, uh, Yes, I mean, I read a lot of, uh, naturally, read a lot of theology from different places. Uh, Bobby Burkhoff, some of my influences, uh, Wayne Grew, naturally, Piper, I love him. Uh, Tony Evans, Pastor E, Pastor Doug, and big influences theologically. So I think we need to read the plot of people. What is the solution to the Experiential wisdom. 
And so I think that's one aspect to that. So like a more sensitive or however you want to term, I would say yes because of that. But that doesn't mean um, there that those shifts are wrong and out of priority. I mean maybe the priority is to get aligned a little bit more. And so all of a sudden we're like, you over here, over here, you, you over here, over here, you now not going to work together to fix this, to solve it, to make it different, to change it. And urban apologetics, black apologetics, whatever the terms should be, should never just be one sort of segment of churches feel or concern. And if you do feel like education, if you get into apologetics and you're so called minority, you by default, learn sort of the standard issues. Like you, maybe you in the inner city, you've never met a Mormon in your life. You end up learning about Mormons. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't know them. But you don't get to hear because you're thinking about the Kemetic Nation of Islam, any of these others that are pressing on you, and then you try to press uh, shit gossip someone. So it's just matter of saying, okay, let's find out what experiences and find out how to link up. So I would say yes to the last part of your question, but I think. Give us some yeah, I, I think that was that was good. I mean, this was excellent. I want to get back and show the church and say, hey, you know, it may be through our church history, you're something quite as good as it is. Yeah, so I mean, this is excellent. I don't want you to misunderstand. Oh, no. Yeah, but, you know, from where I was coming from, I was just thinking, and, and I think he hit the nail on the head. We just don't think that way. Right. You know, it's because I don't have to be forced. I live in the context where it's just it's never crossed my mind. You know, I don't have to see race, it's not a big deal. I mean, black, white, yellow, green, you know, it's it's immaterial. But this is health immensely helpful in understanding how to do this and and know where others are coming from. I think it's immensely beneficial. No, that's what, I mean there, there's not a time in which what would there may be, but unless we're in the majority, unless we're amongst a majority group of other minorities that we're not cognizant of our race. You know, I mean, if you look at the depictions on television, for example, uh, it's mostly white movie stars. And now that, that there's, you got your Denzel, you got your City 48, you got these guys, but I'm saying you see consistently that white faces are put in front of us. You see white theologians that are put in front of us on a consistent basis. So it makes it appear as though African Americans who have been in a place where they've experienced systemic racism from the time we arrived in the 1690s, as though we don't mention problem. And that is the problem. So I always think about race. I'm all that right in the car, and we can talk about the reason. I'm just saying I'm very cognizant of my race and that uh, there's all the stereotypes of African American men specifically being menacing or dangerous. Uh, some people are, don't like to work, but I, I think it's fair to give this advice. You know, if you look at that, we have this subconscious idea about biases uh, toward African Americans. So that makes me, so I'm so African American, very cognizant of that. And I know that that can be uh, eye opening to many of us, but that is something that occurs, especially in our church. So that's why I'm not trying to make this a white and black dichotomy type issue, but rather to try to illustrate. There's some real issues that occur in our communities uh, that our brothers, our white brothers, and sisters are largely in the I was going to say a comment. I think it's also important to recognize that because of the way this uh, social history is happening in America, uh, it seems like African Americans, we think in, as a group, or we are treated as a group. So, as an example, uh, I was a blossom major, and I remember being in class, and a, a, uh, there was one other black guy in class, one of the black students, we were the only black people in class. He said something. It was after the suit. Um, and I got embarrassed. I didn't say nothing stupid. I didn't say nothing stupid. But I got I felt embarrassed because in some way, shape, or form, I knew, and nobody could, nobody, it's not like I'm gonna have a deductive proof for this, but I knew that what he said was gonna reflect on me and what he treated me, right? And I'll, I'll give you another example. I had uh lunch with a with a minister, a uh, dear brother in the Lord, and I, and I I know I've gotten to know him and, and he he's coming from a good place. But when he found out I was reformed, he was shocked that I, as a young black man, would be Calvinistic. Now, I told him the ironic thing is that I'm shocked and I need anybody who's Calvinistic. Because that's just not my, it's not as though reformed theology, big God theology, is foreign in black terms. No, 
It's for everybody. <laughs> but because we have MacArthur and Endeavor and Chandler and Piper, it doesn't seem like it's as alien. So much so that when people think of black church, they think of emotionalism and they think prosperity, gospel, and liberation theology. When that same type of thing is in the white church, it just looks different. We can sing the same three chords of your good, good father. And if I hit that bass chord right, the drum is going right, everybody's hands are going to go up. That's the exact same as a pastor uh, shot that we put from the pulpit, and he ain't said nothing yet. You think the exact same emotional reality. It just looks different because of the context. But, you know, as an African American, that's reflected on me and my theology, even though it has nothing to do with me. Right? But as a white American and a white Christian, you know, somebody can say something off the wall, nobody's going to reflect that back to you. So that group identity um, as an African American is another thing I think is really big. <laughs> so, yeah, it's true. Neo Calvinism, you know, spread uh, the young and restless reform. Now, there's because a lot of Christian hip hop aren't, they're not just now white folks. And so, you know, you have new folks, in fact, church players in the inner city who are black and communist. But, he, even though you might not see all these black Calvinists throughout history, and by the way, there are some, you know, names, there's, there's the ones you can name, and that's really what they were. But the big ideas of Reformed theology are present, especially in the black church. So, things about the spiritual. What is the emphasis there? God's power acting on a helpless people's behalf to redeem them from a situation from which they cannot save themselves from. You see what I'm saying there? Not only that, just think about he's got the whole world in his hands. That's spiritual. That's it's not a kid's song. It's not just a kid's song. It's spiritual originally. It's not that. That's reformed theology. Who's got the whole world in his hands, right? And if you look at a people group in America that have faced all kinds of stuff that had to constantly ask the question of theodicy, meaning why God. The answer is is everywhere present in theology, although maybe someone didn't know to say this is Calvinism or whatever, because they're simply drawing it from the narrative of the Bible, especially the Old Testament. So you see big God, big answers, big rescue, big need, big problem, big, del big deliverance all throughout the theology of the black church historically. And things really, in a lot of ways in the modern church, have just kind of gotten worse recently. So you ask a lot of folks, think of black pastors, they say crap for the dollar. That's a misrepresentation of what's really happened in the past couple hundred years. And we'll never know the slaves who think who wrote songs such and such, but his theology showed up. And so it's not as big a stretch as sometimes you might think. One last um, question, I guess. I guess we're all over on that. But, um, one last question, I think. Um, Talk about the uh, my uh, multi ethnic congregation that the goal is assimilation or integration. Um, I think uh, one of the things that uh, that we talk about, even uh, just sharing uh, uh, difference, even when we picked up the hymnal uh, tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of their cultural themes and say this is multi ethnicity. 
No, this ain't more than ethnicity, it's integration. Because dominant culture still dictates, but now we bring in a certain group, we bring in certain ethnic minorities, and so we bring them into our churches and say, oh, multi ethnic, but we know actually why. There's never, there's not been a compromise between these different ethnic groups. So, so I think, you know, multi ethnicity is cool. We love it. Our church, our church in Canada, even though it's Five or 70% African American in Canada. Uh, we're about 50 50. You know, we got about 50% hmm. white folks, 50% white, maybe 45% black folks, and then another 5% others. And, and we love it. We say hallelujah. We try to go after our specific demographic, and then other brothers and sisters from other ethnicities come. Well, come on in here and let's worship together. You know, but I think even so, when, when Dominant culture moves into ethnic churches. We should be very sensitive to uh, the needs of people in the inner city. And we should be careful not to come into the messianic complex that says, I'm going to swoop in with my resources and my goods and save these people. No, we work together with the indigenous leadership that's honor in that city and in the relationship between ethnic, the urgent, or volatile, or ethnically bad volatile. I love multi ethnicity, multi ethnicity, that's cool, but I, I think the Lord is really honored with your church. Looks like your neighborhood, your city, your town. I think that is what we really wish. Well, if we close it out uh, for tonight, we thank uh, Pastor Curtis. Continues to tomorrow. Um, we will start at nine o'clock, um, and we will have a continental. Uh, if you want to come early for the early birds that are here, um, you can come around eight thirty. Um, we should have donuts and bagels in the fellowship hall, coffee for those that need to, you know, wake up. Um, we'll have that available uh, as well. Um, so at this time, like I said, please give us for holding you over uh, a little, a little over time this evening. Uh, but we will dismiss, and uh, Lord willing, we will catch everyone uh, in the morning. Amen. 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 Amen.